<laughs> so you're ready. Uh, I'm as ready as I'm going to be. You're ready to talk about your feelings in your life, huh? All of the things. <laughs> it's like, I don't even know how bad all the sweat that's oozing through this shirt right now is coming through, but oh. that's, that's why I do everything dark on the podcast. We literally <laughs> just talked about the fact that you don't be sorry, be yourself, because you you cannot help things. Like physi- <laughs> physiological responses to heat are a thing, and we've got the heat on in this place. Oh, well, it's like it's like Dad always used to say, right? Sorry didn't do it, Nathan did. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> My wife hates that. I try and make Ooh. it a joke. I try, des- like on stage, I try and make it a joke, and it's the most depressing joke it I've is. ever tried to It is. I just got a little make. depressed hearing you say it, man. <laughs> Oh my god, we're gonna just start the podcast off with a good cry. Mm. <laughs> like Sarah McLaughlin comes in in the background and starts singing in the arms of an angel. The arms like of an angel <laughs> far away. Exactly. Yes. Oh, we didn't even we didn't need, like our our pre show conversation didn't even get into like why I don't like why I don't like animals and like why I don't do pets like. Uh, so number number one, I'm just like very like I'm a like I'm a germaphobe person. I right? have been in your house, so yeah. I had taken note, right? Yeah, I, I knew that you were um, no you know, shoes, right? Yeah, you, like I got a thing about outside clothes. clothes, right? You didn't want out. That was something that struck me because you didn't want outdoor clothes, and I had assumed like trying. I mean, this is assumption trying to put two and two together here, yeah. like. Is it because of the sort of toxic stuff that you can pick up throughout your day, like bringing that home? I, I just, no, I just, I, I'm, I don't know. I like, I, I like, I've got my inside filth and I've got my outside filth. I just, right. it's, I've, I've, like, so you know, we're we're going to end up talking a lot about like family stuff and whatever else, just because that's like my origin story, right? But the the whole, like, I like, I always grew up in like a hyper, like obsessively clean household, right? Right, like where I was never charged with actually having to do any of the upkeep to create the the like hyper clean like living environment which I got to like benefit from the existence in right right so my best way to manage not living in an outside that has come into my house is to simply stop it at the door <laughs> right like right. that's that's it so like i've you know now having the kids and the wife and the whatever else there's only so much of this that right. works right so i've got like my little sections of the house that i <laughs> that i manage with like i get hey, my own part of the couch all have our domestic neuroses let me tell you you are not <laughs> alone friend but that is interesting i did notice it when i i was in your home um and what is it like from the perspective of Nathan Colombo to see the sort of like sameness, you know, with the the domestic situation that you have, right? Your your domicile, yeah. and then like foreign elements entering, like what? That's an interesting dynamic. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it is. Yeah, I, I just kind of manage it, right? Like again, like I've like I've like I've sectioned off my little spots within the house where I get to like contain my own like inside <laughs> self, <laughs> and like that's that. And like luckily, I mean, my kids are 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 awesome. Like they're nice. they do really well with like taking their shoes off, and they're not like they're they're inside kids too. Like right. I was always an inside kid when I wasn't like a really active outdoor kid. Like it was a mix of, but like they're they're definitely like inside kids well now so. more than ever <laughs> that's the truth yeah um and and my wife just deals with me right <laughs> like she just like she gets it like <laughs> she understands that i've got my issues and she's just cool about it so that's but, a so plus. that's really all you can ask from a super supportive partner yeah. you know because we go through these cycles we try our best to learn how to either cope or like unwork them um, and, you know, some coping skills are really good ones, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, it, being a neat freak during a pandemic has to be a huge benefit, you know, domestically. Um, you if, know, you, if you it, see me looking, like, over this way, I'm just – so I've actually got a monitor here yeah, that we're able to see all your screen on. <laughs> so I'm checking our, like, sound levels. They look good and all that fun stuff. Sorry. Nice. Go ahead. <laughs> but, like, it, it, it seems like it would be a benefit, right, on, mm-hmm. on the one hand. And then, like – it, and also, all you can really ask out of a partner, right, um, is that they accept you for you, yeah. right? That, n- like, 
no conditions. They're not going to try to change you yeah. into someone that you're not. Like they love and appreciate the you that is you. They accept you at face value. I would go with tolerate. Tolerate's a pretty good <laughs> phrase. Well, I'm talking about the <laughs> ideal, Nathan. I'm not talking about lived reality. I'm talking about the ideal here is that we have someone who oh loves and accepts us for us. I it is it has been a it has been a rocky month and a half just because <laughs> of 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 having gotten covid in in the house and i'm i'm just i'm an all like an awful partner when i'm sick like like i'm i'm an okay partner when i'm well but i am a awful partner you and when every, I'm sick. I, I hate to say this but you and every other man yeah yeah true story <laughs> <laughs> so like that's 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 been this this last round of stuff but like it's it's cool because it's we we've got two very different kind of like she's she's a very private reserved person right and i'm like a public figure at this point i guess you would say opposites certainly do attract <laughs> um so and and then you know the the kids are like in in between that like they like they want to be visible and they want to like you know understand what it's like to be in front of the camera and be like performative but they're also like at the same time reserved in their own special little way so isn't it interesting how kids right they're constantly navigating the social tensions of the world but also the tensions within the people who are sort of combining characteristics yeah. within them right um and like there are obviously tensions and lines of tension within every relationship and like we ourselves are attempting to to navigate those tensions between the two of us, mm -hmm. but then you have kids, right? And I don't I don't have children, yeah. um, but I was a child, and I have nieces <laughs> and nephews, and I'm yeah. around a lot of kids. I've got a lot of nieces and nephews, you know, um, and so I've seen it, you know, I've seen it live itself out, where like these small little human beings are, you know, a product of this, you know, all of the benefits, all of the harmony that can mm -hmm. happen in a relationship, and all of its disharmony and tensions, right? And like they're navigating all of those things within themselves and like how the marriage of biology and of learned behavior mm -hmm. and all of the tensions there are just cohabitating within yeah. them. Well, right? and it's wild, right? So I, so I've really gotten to understand like what, like how impactful learned behavior is, right? right. Cause uh, Zach and Peyton, I mean, they're, my stepkids that have been around me for three years now, right now, granted three years at some of the most formative times in their lives. Right. And having had, uh, you know, n not really having had an, an active kind of, uh, you know, what you would consider a traditional father figure, uh, you know, role model in, in your nuclear family dichotomy, uh, you know, as, as we've so often described in this country. So like they've picked up a lot of me in a very short amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> and, but at the same time, like there, there hasn't been as much balance on that. Like they've got, they've got like the biological components of like, they are their mother's children, right. but then they've got like the socialized components of all the stuff that I've brought them. And it's really kind of neat to see how that's all meshed together nice. and how I can kind of like just see that stuff and point it out and then like wonder, wait, are these things that I am now because of them or are these things that they are now because of me? Cause all it's a two way organisms street. <laughs> have like you can see it in physics, right? It's yeah. like all bodies have a gravitational effect on one another, yeah. you know? And I would argue that all organisms are symbiotically related, yeah. right? Like we're not independent or closed off. We always have a relationship to the environment around us and the other bodies that make up a part of that environment. And so just as much as you're pulling them in one direction, they're pulling you in a direction too. You Hit know. him with the intro. Oh, the intro now? No, yeah. I think Do you want me to good. switch cameras? Yeah, switch cameras. Cool. You got it. Nice. Hello and welcome to the WTF podcast. I am your guest host here today, Claire Kilman. This is a show where we talk about interesting things with interesting people. And I'm here with my interesting friend, Nathan Colombo. <laughs> and we're back on. Awesome. Solid. That was really good, Claire. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> hey, uh, you better watch out. I might take your job. <laughs> uh, listen, I, so so like this is. I mean, this is what came up with like the virtual shows and stuff in in January. It's like luckily I had Mike Arthur that had been 
like so like he essentially had has been the guy that's like trained me up on like how to do sound and cameras and all this other stuff and help me put this together and it's like you know I, I i understand that none of this stuff i can just do stand alone it's just like admining the group right mm-hmm. like i i i started off uh you know working with with claire hughes on that who now i'm gonna have to be like claire am i allowed to mention you in the podcast oh too late <laughs> um but like and then and and i i, I should have i should have taken her advice uh and and done some more uh active moderation um, before she was like, listen, you're not moderating this enough. Like, I got to step away. Uh, and then, like, Dawn came on and was like, listen, I'm just going to moderate this. Whether you <laughs> like it or not, we're going to go. Uh, <laughs> and, like, that's that's the reality of it. Like, none of this works, like, as a standalone thing. Like, right. uh, you know, I, can I do a lot by myself? Sure. But, like, it takes a lot of other people that have the same, like, insight and introspection and interest that I have to be able to, like, make this project go. I personally think the founding fathers really missed an opportunity here uh-huh. with the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> because I think a much more practical, much more realistic interpretation of human behavior is like th- that we must declare interdependence, uh-huh. right? We're never fully independent. Yeah. And while like it's 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 one thing to strive to be as independent as humanly possible, right? Yeah. In many ways. But like, you know, we all rely on one another yeah. especially in a place like this you yep. know it's like uh one the people of carbondale are incredibly talented skilled well educated um poor pissed off you know i mean like there are so many <laughs> characteristics that make all of us up more often than not and like there's just there's so much that we should be relying on one another yeah. for you know we're like our lives get better when we rely on one another things get better the wtf podcast gets better when right. people rely on each other can you can you imagine if people were were crying out for interdependence in america <laughs> right hey, now instead I'm, of independence I'm into it. i mean but i mean legitimately like, ah that's socialism well, like what what if the whole thing was flipped around what if a bunch of people were like we lived in a when a, in a properly understood interdependent america Right. Where I mean, we already are an interdependent America. People just fight against it. Right. Right. But instead of that, it was people who were claiming independence, fighting against the concept of interdependence, as opposed to people who recognize that we're already interdependent, having to fight against this notion that, well, you can just stand alone, isolated as a single person, not living in a a community or a society and that you alone can handle it. It's like, nah, man. Nobody alone can handle it. Right. That's what humanity is. Right. It's like boots like bootstrap theory is the worst interpretation of that. You know, it's like <laughs> like the founding fathers had something very different in mind. You know, um, they were declaring their independence as a nation state from, you know, a taxing authority that mm-hmm. they didn't have representation in. Yeah. And like I think that's that was the the motive for yeah. being independent. But like, you know, like taking that and running with it in the direction of like we all have to be hyper independent yeah. you know as individuals like rugged american individualism yeah. man great mistake <laughs> so nathan we are not here to talk about the the antiquated history of the united <laughs> states of america um as as fun as that is we'll do that for, for your podcast <laughs> um we're here to talk about you um, so I have known you for two, three years yeah. now. Um, I met you when you were running for mayor and I was a, a fresh eyed, uh, bushy tailed, um, you know, organizer in a, in a fledgling Carbondale spring. Um, and I really appreciated, um, what you lent to political discourse mm-hmm. in the town at, the, at, at that time. Um, and you know, since then I've, I've maintained a really special relationship to yeah. you as a human being. Um, and I appreciate what you add to the, the, you know, socio-political framework we've got going here in Carbondale. Um, but really I haven't had many opportunities to get to know you. you yeah. Know, like, and, and that was like, you know, so, so in, in wanting to do a series of podcasts with, uh, you know, fellow candidates for city council, you know, I've, I've had plenty of folks be like, well, who's going to interview you? Who's going to interview you? And my thought was, well, I can just have the other candidates just like ask me some questions in the midst of <laughs> their interview. And I realized in in, you know, the first uh, you know, podcast I did with with Nick that that just like it's it wasn't going to work. Right. <laughs> and so like, OK, I, I, I had a handful of options 
you know, I know plenty, you know, I, I know a handful of folks that'd be real good at the interview portion of this that have, you know, the, the understanding of the systems in place here, but you know, those folks already kind of knew too much about me to make this the right exploratory conversation that really the WTF Carbondale podcast is right. right. Cause the whole idea here is that we've got a bunch of people in Carbondale that everybody knows everybody, right? Like right. we've all interacted with one another, but you don't have that backstory. You don't have yeah. like that core component to people's personality and like what brought them to be the person they are in this space. Oh yeah, man. You're getting a fresh set of eyes on you today. Yeah. So like, that's, that's what I wanted to like bring <laughs> forward in the podcast and that's why I thought getting you in as uh, the guest host to interview me was like the just a fit all around, right? You've you've got the intellectual capacity where like we operate on the same wavelength and like the conversation can carry well, right? Um, it's we we have a we have a uh, you know familiar relationship, but we don't have that in depth knowledge of each other and our background. So you've got plenty of of room to explore me as an individual, right? Um, there were other components that I'm just forgetting as I'm going along. So we're going to say being intelligent and, and knowing me, but not like knowing all <laughs> of me make, make for like a really good, uh, and you like, you know how to carry the conversation just in general. Right. So these components kind of coming together were a good fit. And that's why I wanted you to do this. And I, I really appreciate you taking me up on the offer and like, Hey, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm, I'm again, very appreciative of what this podcast does. Yeah. Right. Um, this essentially increases, um, you know, not just social cohesion in a lot of ways, like mm -hmm. WTF Carbondale is a sort of nexus for social cohesion in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. It is a, is a social agora of sorts online. Um, and like this podcast specifically where you're doing a series of, of, you know, interviews with political candidates who are running in local races, um, you know, it's just really important for civic literacy, mm -hmm. you know, getting people familiar with uh, you know what what's going on in the world around them, and in a world that they actually have the ability to reach out and touch and change. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, thank you for doing this, and thank you for running, yeah. man. Well, and it's it's real it's real interesting, right? And and we're we're not going to be, you know, we're we're going to talk a little bit of politics and this stuff, but just like I'm kind of giving everybody kind of their own feeling, like you know, some people are going to want to talk about politics, you know, again specifically the the candidate. Uh, series that I'm doing. Some people are going to want to talk more about politics than right. themselves personally, and some some people are going to uh, talk like solely about themselves as a person. Right? It's going right. to be kind of a nice mix. Right? Everybody's going to get to put on display the person that they want on display. And on this. also, but for, um, everything's a little political. Do I? Everything carries a political oh, consequence, yeah. even who you are as a person. You yeah. know. Um, so I challenge all of the viewers and listeners out there to, um, you know. As we move through and we get to know Nathan Colombo, um, really think about, uh, you know, qu quite uh, fervently and ardently um, and even critically, uh, you know, where Nathan Colombo uh, fits politically in uh -huh. Carbonell because the, he, one, already fits uh, into quite a many places <laughs> politically within Carbondale. Um, but, you know, uh, my man's here has... You know, some goals laid out for him uh, you know, it, on, on the road ahead. That, that's a that's a good tie-in to to a question that Nick kind of kind of propositioned me with. He was like, "Man, you you kind of you kind of like jump around social groups or this that the other thing." It's like, no, dude. Like, I'm just plugged into everything. Right. Like, I spend time where my time is needed when the time is asked of me. Right. Right. Like, and and it's what's nice is like the whole town is like my social sphere right yeah. that's just part of like being being grown up uh in in this space right it just ev like this place is me I, i'm not yeah. going to say what my wife's phrase is for me about this town but <laughs> it uh, it <laughs> it indicates that i like this place a whole whole lot um it uh the, the the other thing about the podcast specifically right i had uh, i had somebody with the league of women voters like kind of quite and I, I've, I've had a couple people question me about this like well you know as a candidate do you think it's you know ethical for you to be doing these interviews right and it's like well if i'm doing it from an ethical standpoint and i'm using the skills that i've already shown i can apply in a particular framework right from a from you know essentially what is a journalistic reporting stance and i'm not coming at it from a uh you know stance where i'm, I'm trying to do this uh for my own political gain right then yeah it is ethical and it's okay and we operate 
in a world where it's not just a three news channels and, you know, one standard message of truth world. Like we live in a very diverse media sphere where everybody is their own reporting mechanism now. Right. And it's like, I've built that. And I had kind of had one of two ways that I could go about this, right? I could either use this mechanism exclusively for myself and stay focused on Nathan, 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 and put on display something that I shouldn't, I shouldn't want, right? Which is to solely be focused on me, or I can use it to actually put everybody on display and all of the ideas on display right. and put on, uh, you know, for this city period.com. <laughs> like, period. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that's, you know, just, just, you know, handling some of those, you know, concerns or objections, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's interesting, right? Because there, I mean, there are people some, that look, have that. Somebody's got to do it. Yeah. You know, somebody has to take that first step. Somebody has to be so in love with this place, right? Yeah. They have to feel um, so compelled yeah. to make this place better that they really just put the work in, Yeah. you know, and make it better one little step at a time. Yeah. So good on you for, you know, not letting um, your critics phase you. <laughs> um, I personally think as long as your intentions are pure coming into yeah. this, that, uh, you know, you've, you've got a good thing going. Yeah. So, well, and it's funny, I've, I've had, I've had, you know, again, the mix of feedback, everything from, you know, I'm concerned about this, which, uh, ultimately was able to easily overcome those, those objections and, right. and work through it to thank you for doing this. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't, you know, I'm not as active politically in the digital space as I am in a physical space. So, you know, I'm, I'm appreciative to have this as part of what I'm doing. Right. And that mix of, of, of things, it's just like, okay, cool. Yeah. That tells me that we're doing the right thing here. And right. if it wasn't COVID, I don't think I'd be as like <laughs> focused on gotta do this, but like because of COVID and because people cannot be as physically close to one another and like teach people in physical spaces about the person that they are, I was like, I have to do this. Right. Like I absolutely positively have to do this because this is one of the few ways that people are gonna be able to not just see kind of the, the you know, two minute answer forum person right that mm -hmm. that they're going to get out of some of the uh, uh you know some of the public forums that are going to go on but like this is that deep dive uh, personal conversation that it's important yeah you know and this gets this gets into you know uh the series of questions that i've got and i didn't really prepare anything i really wanted this to feel a lot more like yeah. just an intimate conversation that people have the privilege of sort of you know listening into right yeah. like everyone who's listening is to be a fly on the wall for you know, uh, the experience of Nathan Colombo here. So, I mean, my first question really is, and, and everything we're talking about sort of feeds into this, mm -hmm. um, what is Nathan Colombo's relationship to Carbondale, right? And vice versa. <laughs> um, because I, uh, I, I think you've been here for a while, yeah. right? So, all right. So, so that's that's a that's a good thing. That was a good way to position this. So, I I am I am a multi generational resident of Carbondale. Yeah. Uh, to the to the point at which, like, you know, as a as a uh, as a typical millennial, uh, the only reason I'm able to own a house is because a relative passed away, and so I was able to have you know 25 percent equity in the house to use as a down payment, and then buy it out from the rest of the family. Uh, when my grandfather passed away, right? So I live in uh, the house that my grandfather built in 1964, right? On the road that bears his last name, right? So like I, I, I like live through, you know, uh, like the, the catalog's not the right word, but I, but I live through like my institutionalized memories, right? Like in this space, like that I'm just, you know, that it, that is the most familiar space to me hmm. um and it's just it's it's neat right so like i'm super tied into um you know just just I, i'm not necessarily tied into like like the history component of it right right as much as i am tied into uh you know just the the immediacy of my upbringing and like carrying on the good parts of that there has uh, to be a from sense my of life. comfort Right? Yeah, uh, like through it, it must feel, and I don't mean to assume, but it no. must feel comfortable to have uh, such easy access, yeah. right, to that where you can reach out and um, literally touch, you know, the mm -hmm. what you're carrying with you, and and giving to the next generation, right? Yeah. Like you are 
and and we all are in this town the inheritors of you know a political and a social and an economic shared life that previous yeah. generations have had together um and you are just as you just said lucky to have such deep roots here you well, know for for me there's there's a lot of this right and we and we talked about this uh you know as we were setting everything up and kind of giving you a primer on uh on on where i might take some of this conversation right but so i'm i for me it's as much about healing as it is anything else right I mean, would right? you talk about that a uh, little more yeah so like you know i am uh I am estranged from my entire like bloodline family, right? Even though my parents live a mile down the road from me, right? Mm -hmm. Like I have estranged myself from my family for for a number of reasons. There's right? a well, I just want to make for everyone listening a distinction there because yeah. Nathan just clarified and said that um, you know he's not necessarily estranged from his family; he has estranged himself yeah. from his family. Um, and continue to pl explain that. Yeah, please. yeah. So I mean, so it's it it, you know, what we what we didn't get to, um, you know, as we were kind of priming priming this conversation is is the steps that kind of got there, right? So like I, I you know, I've I have always had a a, uh, you know, a, a tenuous is that the right word? Is the tenuous oh. even a word anyway? Um, you know, not not an ideal relationship uh, with my parents from even when I was a kid, right? right all the way up into. Uh, middle adulthood and and up to age 27 when ultimately I, I um, you know decided to to remove myself from my family's uh, life and the um, uh, hold on I'm gonna psych myself back here okay. uh, yeah uh, so so getting up to that point right there like there was a lot of exploration that occurred like making that happen right like there was there was try and fix it in your in your mid uh, to, to late teens, like, what am I doing wrong that I right. can try and change to, you know, to try and make this work to, uh, you know, uh, to exploring in uh, the midst of, of my uh, college years, uh, how uh, to actually change the, the, the system of the relationship so it works better. Go I ahead. mean, that's so complicated. Yeah. Right? I mean, you've, on the one hand, got this, you know, complex set, I mean, I mean as, as, as we all do to degrees, right? And in, in your case, it was a, a quite the degree of intergenerational trauma, mm -hmm. right? Um, and how do you, like, they are a part of this place, yeah. right? And you have a relationship to them and them in this place, yeah. right? And you have a relationship to this place. <laughs> so it's like you're teasing out quite a bit there. And mm -hmm. um, as you just mentioned, you know, you're know, you trying to keep yourself as you move through your young adulthood yeah. um, intensely experimental and open-minded about like your relationship to those things. Do yeah. I conform? Am I able to conform, mm -hmm. right? Am I able to marry, um, you know, my own sense of self to the level of expectations and wishes of you know this this household mm -hmm. that uh, has a relationship to this place. Right? So what what's really interesting just to, just about all those components right is where I was able to find solace mm. right. So so when I talk about um, kind of the work that I do right. So I so I'm a I'm a marketer right. Like that's what I do professionally right. I I help people craft brands, craft, uh, you know, uh, identities, both through, you know, whether it's digital or physical media or whatever else it may be, right? That's part of how the WTF Carbondale brand has been able to grow because I understand this from a professional standpoint, right? right? How, to, how to grow a brand. Um, so I, I was able to learn, like, my, my, my craft, my, my trade uh, in, like, just in Carbondale, working with businesses, like, getting chance to, like, have – uh, mentors that like gave me a chance to like attach myself to uh, their business activity uh, sometimes fail sometimes succeed right but I was always relatively inexpensive so it wasn't too bad um, <laughs> but what I was able to do in school right where I didn't go to school for business or marketing or whatever else I went to school uh, for communication I went through the speech communication school Johnny Gray was one of my professors oh, right I love um, you know the uh, Brian Crow was one of my professors. Oh, Susan Daughton was one of my professors. Mm -hmm. Like I can tell you that one of the papers that I wrote specifically, like that was trying to address 
uh, you know, my, my, my family issues. Like I wrote for uh, Brian Crow's uh, interpersonal communication class. Like I did like a, you know, like a 10 page dissertation on, I don't know how long a dissertation is supposed to be. So if 10 pages is not enough to be a dissertation <laughs> uh, for all the people out there that have actually done so, don't judge me. I there apologize. There are so many PhD <laughs> candidates who are seething right now. <laughs> 10 pages, huh? Anyway, right. so, um, <laughs> So like I, I mean I really did like deep dives into this stuff like and and bounced it off of professionals that like have explored these things right I mean We're, you had some top notch educators yeah you know I mean those are some compassionate intelligent human yeah. beings um, how has your relationship to them I mean you you talk about you know coming through so much arduous tenuous familial life mm -hmm. right um and then finding solace in uh you know your ability to communicate not just for yourself but yeah. for other people right to so communicate that's... concepts brands um etc uh -huh. like how i mean how have all of those things ultimately led to a better more well-rounded nathan colombo so so um specifically like that that is you know i i sought out becoming a better person through education, right? right? That's that's why I went down that path. That, interestingly enough, goes back to um, uh, Maudie Graham, who was, like, an old friend of our family who, like, I grew up going to church with and, like, you know, my parents would babysit uh, her daughter when we were kids. And, like, she was, she was a speech uh, sh uh, teacher for me in uh, junior college at John A that, like, set me on the right track that, oh, this is how I understand. Like we we had one of those we had one of those speech classes that was like a breakthrough for people, mm -hmm. right? That like changed people's lives. Like one of those type of movies that, or one of those types of uh, classrooms that they make Hallmark movies about. You know, right. <laughs> it's like like that's that's the type of experience that uh, that I had in that, and that set me on the right course. Um, you know, and then specifically, you know, how does how does some of that affect me? Well, you know, because I. Because I don't have this traditional, uh, you know, the uh, mindset that a lot of folks have that you know oh, I I do things, uh, you know, following kind of the the family line or hmm. you know doing things to make mom or dad proud or right. whatever else that like you know I I replace uh, that kind of authority figure with people that I've sought authority from right. right. So even though Johnny may not know it right, the fact that I've went through a couple of his classes and learned a lot more that I understand that I've learned now than I would have understood that I learned, you know, actually in the classroom then right. that like I position myself as when it's, when it's an activity that I'm doing something that would fit in with uh, a critique that Johnny might have. It's like, am I doing this right? Am I doing this in a way that, you know, Johnny would, you know, at least give me a B plus on. Right. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, like it's that's all a about fit. the families, especially, you know, I share a similar background in many ways it's like when you don't have um you know a, a traditional family behind you right mm -hmm. that you're pulling from or if you do pull from it it's like there's an intensely negative charge there it really is about what what you construct right and the sort of things that you build mm -hmm. for yourself and the, the role models that you you put into place yep. um and i think it's really cool that you found you know so many important role models to help guide you um you know even if even if they're not there now right as yeah. like a father figure well right? and it's, it's it like really, they're there they're there in here yeah right? well and, and that's it right it is it is the ability to to conceptualize them as a role model right because right? i you know i never i never had you know some sort of you know uh deep connection with any of these individuals as standalone professors in right. school right i just was able to take from them the the teachings that they were there to espouse right. and and then was able to build this construct of a role model in my head and then work to fulfill that. It's the inner role model. Yes. Right? It's like yes. It's like all of the things that that you recognize as decent and good qualities yep. in someone else as desirable qualities. Yep. You know, not just to you but to society. Yep. Right? It's like why not take those into yourself? Yeah. Why not use them as a cognitive mirror yep. to hold yourself up against and aspire to? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that that's a, a really good technique for building a better you. Yeah. 
Um, so you mentioned earlier that you have a relationship to WTF Carbondale. Like, not that anyone <laughs> listening to this podcast would Doesn't know that, know. right? <laughs> um, however, I would like to hear from the horse's mouth. There you go. What your relationship <laughs> is to WTF Carbondale, in your own words. Um, you know, it is. It is my it, man. <laughs> oh, what is it to you what is wtf carbonyl to you what does it mean to nathan oh so much right it it bear bear with me here because there there's there there is a good amount to to unpack here because it the platform itself has evolved over time right oh, yeah. for 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 me if i if i was to position it as as if i was to give you one word for it right mm -hmm. it is performative Right. And, and so performative is so many things to me. Right. Because I am a performer. Right. Right. As as somebody who who actually participates in the act of entertainment, uh, you know, from what I guess you consider is a professional standpoint now, because there are you know, I do a lot of volunteering for it, but I've also gotten paid for it plenty. Right. So like, you know, all it takes to call yourself a professional is to get paid, even if it's a dollar. It's, there's a textbook <laughs> definition, and a dollar covers it. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, but it, but it is performative, right? And it is the, it is the kind of performative personality of Carbondale, right? And I would say that's really kind of where it where it started out when I was able to take it over, right? So to give to give folks kind of some background on this, it was started about a year, year and a half before I actually got my hands on it. There were there were three um from what from what I recall, I believe it was three um local individuals who actually created it. Um it really gained traction uh when it posted uh the um uh the graffiti at um Fainter Hall in 2015 right so that was kind of the initial bump of uh growth in the page that got it from you know a small uh following to about 3,500 people right. give or take uh and then it was just kind of you know on and off from time to time the the three folks that originated it would post a little bit of content here a little bit of content there but it wasn't hyperactive uh and then i was and then i took it over uh, i didn't take it over when i first uh started utilizing the platform i asked if i could have access to the platform right. um to to essentially go out there and refute uh the owner of a local brewery who was talking trash and i didn't like the trash he was talking and i thought his trash talking was doing more harm than good it wasn't actually critiquing the policy it was just him whining and complaining don't need to go down that road anymore i've already hashed out that battle uh <laughs> this really underscores you know a a larger point of what WTF Carbondale means, yeah. right? Where like it may have started out as a performance, yeah. but it really caught on and grew roots into what society means overall. I yeah. mean, Butler talks a lot about social performativity theory, mm -hmm. where it's like all of us are constantly performing. Yeah. Oh, right? yeah. We're, absolutely. We're constantly in this state of like, relaying information of curating ourselves such that we re relay the most accurate information um to our society we're reflecting its values yep. and we're hoping that its values reflect ours and like we're doing this mirroring performance this dance if you will the social dance um with our society and i would say our society when i say that is carbondale right yeah. like carbondale society and d you know wtf carbondale has certainly evolved you know, into oh, yeah. this publicly accessible, you know, hyper publicly accessible brand mm -hmm. for Carbondale. And it is the performance of, and it's like yes. a publicly accessible performance yep. of Carbondale that everyone who lives here or who loves this place, right? Or who maybe doesn't love this place yeah. even, <laughs> um, is an actor in, yeah. right? It's like, we're all public actors and this thing has certainly come to the the fore at least in so on social media yeah right as being a vehicle for that performance as, yeah. a, as a sort of stage well and and arguably right that so so for me right i always i always explain uh the work that i do and why i am very good at at my trade craft of marketing right is because my work is to bridge 
the gap between digital and physical spaces because mm -hmm. I've grown up in a world in a way um, as you know an only child in a, in you know a space where I didn't live in a neighborhood with a bunch of kids in a house where I had to be quiet because of work schedules and all this other stuff that like you know my my life is understanding like uh, you know life through the through the lens of uh, the internet and computers and uh, you know video games and, and other digital spaces uh, right that there is to me no no difference they are they are one and the same right right you are you are simply because it, it's very you know Social media is a very real thing. You and I can both pull up our phones right now, and it's right there. Right. And it's impactful on our right here, right now, in this physical space. Yeah. And we are producing we something in this. Here. Do what? You know, we would not be here yeah. with each other if it weren't for social media right now. Yep. Um, and I also, I think this may be, like, a big generational shift, you know? I grew up very similarly, right? Where, like, I've always had access to the internet. Yep. You know, I've always had access to the social forums that exist online mm -hmm. and like those are just as real in many ways and sometimes even more impactful than you know interpersonal conversation mm -hmm. um in in physical real time yes um so i'm i'm just wondering what do you think now like now and moving forward wtf carbondale's significance is for carbondale so so, uh, so uh, and and this is where i'm gonna you know talk a little bit about uh you know, politics and, and platform tied into, right. uh, you know, what I've, what I've, whether I meant to or didn't mean to, you know, I, at the end of the day, like, I, I don't know what I mean to do with this platform. I'm just <laughs> doing what I think is right at the time, right? I'm, I'm conceptualizing what I can do in the future and then following through on it if it's the right thing, right? right. I've been thinking about the podcast for two years, right? Yeah. Like, I can go back and reference interviews that I've done where I'm like, right. I'm going to do this really cool Carbondale-centric media project, but... <laughs> It's not there yet, and it's like here we are two years later, and we're finally there. Um, but now I'm at the point where it's like, okay, we need a digital front door, right? right? And I've been building Carbondale's digital front door for the better part of a decade, yeah. right? Um, specifically through client work, right? Being able to help uh, you know work with local businesses to develop kind of their digital presence, right? And most specifically. Um, for some folks, focused on reviews, right? Um, so when people look up, uh, you know, local local things, like the most searched stuff in uh, most places is uh, service activity, right. right? You know, phone numbers for restaurants, hours for grocery stores, things like that, right? So right alongside those are reviews that tell you, um, you know, whether or not some place is, is, you know, a three-star experience, a four-star experience, a five-star experience, whatever. Right. Right. So I was lucky enough to attach myself uh, and my work to several businesses that were already five-star businesses, right? But I just helped to craft and curate, um, you know, their visibility as such, uh, you know, in review spaces specifically, right? So that was kind of step one in digital, you know, in building that digital front door, right? right? So you get kind of that base layer in place, right? You start to kind of just work up step by step, finding other components to build out to. Um, one of the other components to that, right, is, uh, you know, through some of the volunteer uh, work that I do, getting media exposure, right? So making sure that we've got a constant flow of information going out to newspapers and television stations about positive activity going on in Carbondale uh, attached to very visible projects, right? So right. that itself builds another component to the digital front door of Carbondale, um, you know, showing that there's a balance in, uh, you know, the, the negative issues that we have in our community uh, with, uh, you know, the positive things that we have going on just as well. Well, this gets me to, you know, a question that really stuck, you know, for me. Can, um, I, can I finish real quick just oh yeah, on... Of course. Um, Cut that Sorry, out. but but no, I just I just didn't want to get too far off, and I don't and I don't know where this next question is is going. So I'll I'll, I'll polish up on on the last bit of WTF Carbondale um, and what I'm building here. So then then you come along and you figure out well what what other things can you continue to do? Yeah, the page is is okay, and I get to express some things here and there. But I was like, you know, it's time to to show that that interactive, uh, you know, the interdependent component, right, uh, of. Uh, you know, societal relationships. And that's where launching the Facebook group kind of came into play 
Oh, where, was that where you were going full next circle. with the question? No, no, no. no. I just okay. we, we wound up coming full circle in yeah. conversation. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so that is that is ultimately kind of where where the last piece of the puzzle was, right? Like I have done I have done about the extent that I can uh, as a singular individual working through uh, you know different uh, known entities and known commodities in uh, you know our our little our. Uh, little cohesive society of, of Carbondale, right. uh, the next component was to give everybody else access to that activity and allow them to build on to it from there, uh, right? Without having the direction or the marketing component that, that you know, what I'm doing is actually trying to drive folks one way or the other or trying to convince oh, somebody, um, you know, that, that they need to do business here or they need to, uh, you know, support this project. Uh, it became, okay, well, now you have to show, and when I say you, I mean our citizens, right? right. Our, our neighbors, our community members have to show what this place is on their own. I can't just go out there and say it myself. And what we're doing now at this point is testing the hypothesis of is what I've done to put this place on display for the past decade the place that we really are? And the answer to that is very clearly fucking yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it, a really, really good place to be. Man, it, so again, bringing it back, like when when I talked earlier about like what you want from a partner, mm -hmm. right? It's like you want, or it, what you want to be able to love that person for face value at yeah. face value. You want, you want to love that person for who they are. You don't want them to change. Yeah. And like, I'm relatively new, right? I've lived here for nearly a decade yeah. now and I have committed myself to, you know, making Carbondale better because I love this place. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, the level of love, that you must have for this place, yeah. right? To have lived in it your entire life, right? To have such deep familial ties here to, you know, not just uh, build a brand for it, but to hand the keys over to yeah. everyone to make it pu so totally publicly yeah. accessible. Um, and then still, and I, I would sort of make an analogy here where like, it's almost like I'm marrying this, uh, entity that I haven't known that long, right? Like mm -hmm. this is, this is my, uh, my, my, my early marriage here to Carbondale. Whereas like you, and specifically as it relates to you running for council, you yeah. know, and being an active participant here and making this place better, it's like you are renewing your wedding vows, mm -hmm. right? Um, after decades of being in a marriage with something, yeah. right? And like, how how much do you love Carbondale, man? It's 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 gross how much I love this place. <laughs> like, like I said, like it's gross to the point where like my wife teases me about yes. it uh, because that, that's just it, right? And and the reason why, right? Because every everybody has their 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 components to their life that they draw their identity from. Right. And I draw my identity from this town, from this place, from our people. Right. Right. Like, like if this place ceases to be the place that it has always been, right. Like, like let's say that, you know, we can't find our way out of the issues that we face as a town with a declining population and all these other uh, right. systemic issues that we're trying to address. If, if we find ourselves uh, depleted and destitute 20 years from now, right? Like I am going to crumble apart because the place that I draw my core identity from will have ceased to be right. and thus I will have ceased to be. Right. Like, I think that that's a very beautiful way to put it. No. You know, I mean, you are so symbiotically entrenched. Yeah. here you know there it feels so like the, when you say that right it's it's feels so deep mm -hmm. right like i can i can really feel it if man i mean it's so healthy you know you're it, you've lived here your whole life you've seen this place go through so many phases yeah. you know knowing what what i do about this place's history right and and being a student of history like y you're still in a healthy relationship yeah here you you still have a very you have a very healthy marriage to Carbondale. So the a, a very interesting component of that right is that like I this is by no means like I'm not the only person that feels this way in any way shape or right. form. There's so many people that feel a very similar way to this and express it in their own different ways and there's so many more people that are 
you know, well older than we are that have really experienced this place, right? Mm-hmm. And it's because of all of these people that have like essentially while 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 um you know the the foundation to the house has has started to crack, like they are still the support beams holding up right. uh you know the roof. Like there we still have so many of these people that are like community pillars that say we've been here through all of this and we're not just letting this place go. And they're in turn taking that type of entrenched love and understanding for this place and not just what it is, but what it also represents and then handing it off to another generation of folks like you and I. Right. right. Like, I don't know much about your and Ray's relationship. We'll explore that when we do your podcast eventually. <laughs> but I would imagine like there's a significant like, you know, very much like the giver. Right. right. Like, you know, I, I, I'm not I'm not a big novel reader, but like that's one of the ones that I've been through. Right. And it's like, you know, you put you put hands on. And we're just transmitting memories and like sharing oh, yeah. like the the raw experience that doesn't really get understood when all you're doing is glossing over like words on a page it's so important for us right as younger people mm-hmm. right um but adults right like we are we are fully fledged adults yeah um who live in a society and i grew up in a small town um with parents who you know understood that you know everyone has a place within the social fabric of a town yeah right and you get like you get bestowed as you age (laughs) the sort of keys to the castle yeah right um like you you pass the baton you pass Mm -hmm. the torch um to the next generation and then it happens again you know um like we're gonna have to as as political operatives as political actors in a town hand over all of what we've done, right? Mm-hmm. The baggage, yep. the um, you know, the 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 good, the bad, and the ugly, mm-hmm. the secrets, you know, yep. all of it. We're getting now. It's like that's what we're now in the process of, and what I, I assume you're in the process of yeah. running for office. We're shouldering the burden of it. Yeah, you know, and um, like I guess the question is, how do we, right? And I say we in a collective sense because it's going to take all of us working together. Yeah, I'm asking you this question, right? Because you're who we're here to to pick through. How do we take all of what Carbondale is, right? Shoulder all of it and build a better world out mm-hmm. of it, right? Because we're getting it. Yeah. You know, we're it's coming down the pipe straight at us. We've got to be ready. Yeah. You know, and what are we going to do with it? Yeah. I mean, you know, ultimately you've got to be honest, right? Yeah. And and so I, I think one of the things that was really good was in in Amelia Blakely's piece recently uh, that covered uh, you know the copper site right was that uh, she said I, I can't remember specifically what the line was but she was talking about you know this self proclaimed diverse place that's not really the you know as as diverse as it says that it's still got you know these these structures of de facto segregation and all this uh, you know other other issues right along racial lines and it's like you want to you want to know how you like actually handle these things uh you know generation to generation uh is you tell the truth about it um another really you know that i I tie this to a broader uh political issue i watched uh rafael warnock and john ossoff uh sit down uh with uh, a handful of performers in atlanta uh it was like uh Oh gosh, I can't remember the other folks that were part of it, but the but like one of the main people that was uh, facilitating it was Killer Mike, right? Yeah. And Killer Mike doesn't mess around, oh, right? No. Killer Killer Mike, you know, really gets it um, in terms of how to how to analyze, uh, you know, then then really a- attack the issues within. Uh, you know, our, our modern political system. And they were talking about cannabis and about cannabis equity. And they uh, were just like, you know, he, he dug them beyond, uh, you know, just, oh, do you support legalization? He was like, do you understand, right, that the war on drugs was the war on black people in this country and that cannabis was used to inflate our prison population with black bodies and that there's, that, that, you know, the actual development of the market, uh, you know, that we're at has seen, uh, you know, a specific group of people, uh, you know, be, 
penalized for being part of building uh, that market. Hold on, I've, I've got it. I, I know, I know, you've got like more questions no, coming up, but I'm. It's just interesting, you know, it, when that intergenerational power transfer happens, mm -hmm. right? It's almost like they don't want to acknowledge where they messed up, where yeah. they went wrong, oh, what yeah. the structural problems yep. that they couldn't solve yep. were, or that they just allowed to fester. Ooh, were. this this opens me up to getting around. I will bring I will bring that concept back around to myself here in okay. just a second. I really like how you position me there for that. Um, so so Killer Mike at, at kind of the end of his statement, he was like, his thing was just like tell the whole story. Like right. you're telling some of the story, but you're not telling all of the story. He was like, right. if you want to actually make policy that's going to be most impactful and serve the constituents that are going to put you in a position to be able to exercise power to benefit not just the constituents that elected you, but all constituents that you were supposed to serve. He was like tell the whole story right and that's it right that's what we have to do as a community specifically here in carbondale if we're going to do it right for the next 20 40 60 years whatever it is like building that you know modern uh you know municipal society is we got to tell the whole story right and we don't do that we just don't um we tell we tell the stories that make us comfortable Right. Uh, we tell the stories that we think make us most protected, uh, but we don't tell the stories uh, that are as true to the actual events that occurred um, as what they are. Right. Now, you were talking about. Can you kind of do you do you recall exactly what you had kind of just um, said? Just the interesting dynamic between generations. Right. Uh -huh. We're like when they're passing down a political legacy, mm -hmm. right, or the structures of a place, um, it's almost like in the story they acknowledge about it, right, on the surface level, their ego can't take, mm -hmm. right, L looking deeper at what they allowed to fester, yeah. right, or at the problems that they couldn't solve, right? So and so there's not this deeper reflection of all of the evil that they allowed to happen yeah. passively or actively. So so that's that's an interesting component that ties back to you know my, where where my politics intersects with uh you know my my uh issues with family. Right. Right? That that it just doesn't feel like there's been that full reckoning that need to happen in the previous generation to make it work for the next generation. Right. So like, I, I, I guess if there's like really a place where I draw on that. It's personal. Yeah, it's very personal, right? right? And and where, where I failed to work up in a generation, right? From the, you know, where I, where I failed to work uh, into solutions for the previous generation, um, you know, I will work through for solutions to the next generation for, for my kids now yeah. um but at the same time it's like it's the same idea with this town right like yeah. i i can't work backwards to fix for previous generations that failed to fix these issues in their real time but can we do it for the next yeah right and you know for some of this you know it's it's may not even be a question of can we fix a specific thing right. but can we simply tell its truth and understand why something is broken and why it may never be fixed at the end simply that we have to tell its story and understand that there is no fixing this. you can't build a past right the past yeah. is already built yeah. it's like if you're in the present and attempting to build a, a past what you're doing is you're obfuscating yeah right like if you are in the process of actively trying to create a past for something yeah. um like I, I guess uh, aside from documenting the truth right but if you're trying to construct this this past in the present that's a i mean that's that's a, that's to me is is nowhere near as valuable as constructing a future yeah you know um in the present you're you're building the the future for a place and its people yeah well in the in the past you know the past is the story that you got to tell the truth about the future is the truth of the story that you're doing, you know, that you're writing now. Yeah. Um, you know, if that even is a thing, I don't know, I'm trying to make words sound fancy. Oh, we're together. getting very uh, philosophical <laughs> here. <laughs> so, so kind of jumping back to right the, the group and, and concepts and like, I, you know, Carbondale itself, I, I tell folks, right. I didn't have to go to the world. The world came to me. Right. Right. Really, really simple way of describing this place. And one of its like values to the individual, right? Like that's not, 
how we represent ourselves, but that is a significant value to the individuals that exist within our community, right? That you get global exposure in small town America. Yeah. All right. And and while some people could be like, oh, well, there's plenty of college towns with international populations and all these things. But there's there's so many things that go on in this town. So many people that exist in this town that represent so many different components of America and the world at large. Yeah. That it's like that. No, there is there is not the same type of activity and closeness right, that is replicated in many places throughout this country. I'm sure there are other places in this country where, where this can be, uh, you know, similar, but this is a very special place. I've been to a lot of places. Yeah. You know, I've, I've gotten around. I've seen places that are, you know, Carbondale's uh, nemesis palace walk, right, uh -huh. where they take the worst of a small town and the worst of a big city and they try to smush it together, uh -huh. right? And it just comes out awful. Yeah. Um, but then you've got Carbondale, which is like all the best parts about being a metropolitan, you know, um, elite world-class city, Yeah. right? And all of the best parts about pastoral life, rural simplicity, and yeah. like the beauty of nature. Mm -hmm. And you have just this harmonious interconnectedness between those two modes of being yeah. here, right? Um, and like, You've again. You've lived here. You love this place. We are not perfect. No. Right. This place is is not a perfect place. However, you can get by here if you don't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's it's honestly a safe place to be for someone like me. Yeah. Right. Um, and there are worse places mm -hmm. in this world to wind up than Carbondale. There are so many worse places to be. You know, we've got we've got something really good going here. Would you talk more about Let's just focus on the positive for mm -hmm. a second, like those benefits to living here and being brought up here, mm -hmm. you know, like like you talk about um, m multicultural experience and, you know, having access to a variety of cultures that you probably would have never had otherwise. Yeah. Like how has that, do you think, impacted you as a human being? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 have, I have never had to leave this physical space to have... Uh, you know, the the insights that some folks would have to travel the world for. Right. right? Uh, and, and that, you know, that goes back to that saying, you know, I didn't have to go to the world. The world came to me. But like, it's very like it's very real, like and it's very individualized. Right? right. Like, I don't understand everything about everybody all over the world. Right. And nobody can or nobody does. Right. But the reality is like I, I was, a, you know, I, I, I'm able to be, again, the person that I am because of. Uh, you know the the right kind of relationships uh, and the right kind of experiences that you know wouldn't happen 20 miles down the road right right it's not like this is happening in Marion or Harrisburg or Mount Vernon or you know your other uh, you know uh, small uh, metropolitan uh, you know city type areas in uh, rural southern Illinois right it's very specific to Carbondale right um, and uh, can you kind of ask me that question one more time? Sorry, I, I start talking, I get no, off on tangents. I want to make sure I, I mean, get... what are the, what are the benefits of living here? You know, I mean, we have so many things here that are, are difficult, yeah. you know, um, but so many things that are absolute blessings. So the key, key to anything, uh, I think is people get to define, uh, their, their lives. Right. Right. So in a lot of places, right, whether they be big or small, right, uh, folks don't have the ability to, to define uh, their own life, to to choose their own path, to move at their own pace. Right. right? Excuse me. And that that happens in small town rural America. That happens in big city metropolitan USA. Right. And you are you are simply. A, a victim of uh, the system in which you are sent through. Right. Right. And here, I think we are participants in the society that we want to be a part of. Right. Right. And you have to choose this place. Yeah. You know, I mean, this place is small and it is off the beaten path. Yeah. You, if you come to Carbondale, you do it with a certain level of like intentionality. Yeah. And you hear of people flying the coop 
and com- coming back because All they, the time. there's no place <laughs> like it on earth. Yeah. If you're in any other small town in America, what's happening to you right now is probably capital is fleeing. Mm-hmm. You know, you relied on certain sectors of the economy and like you were forced into those, mm-hmm. right? Like you had limited options. And if you go to a major metropolitan area in the United States, you are constricted because you are dependent on capital, mm-hmm. right? It's like those are places that capital has fled to mm-hmm. and is and is cloistered itself behind, you know? And you are a part of this, this system of capital f- flowing mm-hmm. there and you're dependent on it, you know? And so you are restricted, more or less. Yep. I think that's a really... You know, I'm so glad I asked that question mm-hmm. just because it so perfectly illustrates, you know, what appeals to someone like me yeah. who is so non-normative mm-hmm. um, but has found so much love here. Like, I've, I've, I've never felt abnormal yeah. living here. And it's hard not having, you know, um, you know, a life's worth of experience here to really put a pin on why that is. But that mm-hmm. is such a beautiful illustration of, like, why it is so valuable you know, to anyone from all walks of life to like that you can you can just find a life yeah. here. You know, there is there is the life you want to create, the future that you f- feel like's worth living mm-hmm. in is buildable here. Yeah. And, and it's it's buildable at all levels. Right. And if we're specifically talking about capital, right, like right. you can you can live a life on minimum wage in Carbondale and it right. be an OK life. Right. And you can live a life as a millionaire in Carbondale. Yeah. We Let's got be real. That life isn't going to be wildly different in terms of societal participation. You still have access to the same stuff. Amenities are going to be different, sure. right? The house is going to be bigger. The car is going to be shinier. The this, that, the other thing. But that doesn't change the validity of your participation in, in the society. society. You mean you still have to rub elbows? Yes. Right. It's like you're the elbows that you rub are going to come from like literally all walks yeah. of life and there's no if you come here there's no way out of that not a, right. no not way a chance. out of it not like, a you chance you could have more money than god yeah you come here you're gonna have to rub bubbles with homies like you're gonna have to meet homeless people because yeah. we have them and you know like and you're not just gonna have to meet them like they're going to be a part of your life literally like you're going to know people's names yeah you're going to like understand that like you know here's the deal right i i don't i don't give money to Every every person who looks displaced or has a sign on the side of the road, right? But I have relationships with a handful of people that I know that I do support, right? Because right. I know that I do that with a handful of folks and support them. I know that there are other people that have those same types of relationships out there. So I don't have to worry about everybody. I just have to worry about a handful of people that are as close to me as they can be. And if we all do a little bit of that ourselves, guess what? That makes it just a bit more manageable for those folks that are displaced to exist. Hell yeah. Can we talk for a second about the generosity of this place? Yeah. It's like, you know, statistically speaking, we don't have a lot to go around, right? Yeah. But again, we still have access to so much yeah. here in a lot of ways, culturally, um, et cetera, et cetera. But like, we are so generous. There are so many community groups fighting for causes, mm-hmm. fighting for the little people, sticking up for themselves, yeah. right? And there are so many different social programs that we have implemented that, you know, people, um, you know, in the nonprofit sector and, and the do-gooder economy mm-hmm. literally just support, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we just have people, like, my favorite case is Jason Tanner, yeah. right? We're like, that is an individual, and this is maybe a bit of a controversial statement, but, like, that is an individual who lived for a number of years in Carbondale and is a testament to the generosity of our people, mm-hmm. right? It's like he was a beloved local figure um, despite – faults that we we all have plenty of right we've all got faults but like he was cared for yeah you know he people took care of him here he wasn't just cared for though right and that's a that's a key distinction in this place that there are there are people on the street in tattered clothes sleeping under bridges that are in a position and will be in a position at some time that will take care of somebody who may be a millionaire and they'll never know until that moment happens right, right? cuz i can i can i can tell you i have experienced it firsthand and i have and i have watched it happen to friends where they have been in positions where somebody that that would otherwise just be looked at as you know a a destitute person on the street was there for them when they needed them to be there right. 
and that was just it. That's the reciprocity of this like community that we live in that no matter who you are, you're going to bring value to this place. It, again, it does not matter if you are a person in tattered clothes on the street with a sign living under a bridge or you're a millionaire in a freaking mansion, man. Like everybody is doing something here to benefit other people. We have a topsy turvy form of generosity. You know, I mean, it yeah. is it's just all encompassing. Um, and, you know, I, as, as a relative new arrival, right, it's like I myself have been on the receiving end and had the privilege of generosity here yeah. you know b being able to extend it and being able to receive it yeah you know and it doesn't surprise me at all that you are the person that you are you know that yeah. you are the nathan colombo that you've become mm -hmm. having lived in a community like this yeah. for as long as you have i mean w th that is truly a beautiful you know impartment yeah. upon you as a human being I mean, I'm just, uh, yeah, again, it's, it's why I say, you know, I'm, I draw my identity from here. Right. right. And, and just, I, and it's like point blank period. Yeah. I, 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 I am very lucky to have had in the short 31 years that I've been on this earth, the ability to experience these things. And like, I'm just, I'm, I'm really interested to see, like, cause you, you know, I mean, you're, you're 25. Yes. Nice. Uh, <laughs> Right. So like it, it, when I was 25, it was like, well, well, why haven't you conquered the world yet type of mentality? <laughs> right. And that's I think that's just something that, that everybody that's in our kind of generational brackets have been conditioned to do that. Like right. if you're not if you're not this like ardent success by, you know, age 25, 27, whatever, if you're not a if you're not like this, this, uh, you know, uh, uh, ironed out success really by age 30, then you failed. And that's all BS, right? Agreed. Uh, <laughs> and, and as I'm, as I'm getting out of that mentality and getting into, uh, you know, this, this latest mentality that I've got of, you know, the next 30 years is for me to just build and work and whatever. Like, I'm really excited to see what all happens next and like how I take all of these different components and all of these different attributes that I've kind of like, you know, uh, um, uh, What's what's the right word here that I'm looking for? Uh, I don't I'm think internalized is the right word, but like collected and made part of, you know, right. have been lucky for it to make itself part of me. Yeah. Um, right. And how do I how do we apply that moving forward? And how do I, you know, my my biggest concern, as silly as this sounds, is that um, like I got it's like I got to go out and I got to I got to find a way to make more of me. Right. right. Like, like I, like how do, right. Cause I, I I'm not going to sit here and like have an expectation for my children to have the same feeling and connection to this place as I have. Now, granted, like I've given them a number of exposures to, uh, you know, cool things that I hope that they take away, but I'm, you know, if they're like 20, 21 and they're like, I'm going to New York, I'm going to LA, I'm going to, you know, Billings, Montana or whatever, yeah. like go for it, like do your thing. Like if you don't have the same, like love and passion for this place that I do. And you want to go experience life somewhere else, like good on you. Um, but my concern is that like, I don't impart that, like that, that I can't, that I can't build this network of folks that can feel the same imparting of, of value in this place uh, as I have felt. Um, but again, like we discussed earlier in the podcast, I feel like there's a bunch of people already out there like that. Yeah. Yourself is one of them. Absolutely. I mean, I love <laughs> this place. Yeah. Right. It's like you don't have to conquer the world, the whole world, right? The yeah. world's a really big place. <laughs> um, but you do have to conquer your place in it, yeah, right? And, like, whatever that means to you, there's a place for you in Carbondale, yeah. right? Like, conquer your place here, you know? Conquer your place in Carbondale. We have got space for you. So that, that leads me into... Uh, you know, the, the, the big, the big policy thing that I'll, that I'll throw out here that we'll talk about, right? Like we've mentioned politics a lot in this, but we haven't really like dug into politics in this, which I, yeah, I think is supposed good. to be about you. I'm I know, I know, I know, no, it's good. I know, um, <laughs> conquer your place in Carbondale, right? Um, you know, find your place in Carbondale. Those ideas are, are very like that. That's what our, we didn't, you know, find your place in Carbondale. It's a lot more of a fit than always open. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, when you so I have my own bone to pick, you know, with um, the I mean, it's it's really the paradox of tolerance. Yeah. Right. Um, in a Ooh, nutshell. That's good. Yeah. Fair yeah. It's it's uh, you know, if we're open to everything, are we open to Nazism? 
Yeah. Are we open to the way of Nazism? Um, are we open to the the way of homophobia? Mm-hmm. Right. It's like, is that a way? And I would say no. Like that. You know, if we're open to homosexuals, people like me, if we're open to, um, you know, m- like Muslims and uh, you know people who do not fit the 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 stereotypical uh, post World War II American yeah, yeah, ideal, just like, right? You know. White, um, nuclear, straight that, family. Right. Yeah. That, like, if you're bigoted against those people, you probably aren't going to fit in here. Yeah. But, like, it still leaves a lot of linguistic room that I find to be, like, just a little bit irksome, yeah. personally. Like, uh, m- maybe not all <laughs> ways open, but definitely, like, there's a place for you here. Yeah. 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 And, like, even is, is there, we still have people that are homophobic racist yeah. bigoted like oh yeah they exist in our community yeah right um our society structured around it all societies are we see them yeah and in carbondale yeah. we try and love them until they learn their way out of it right that's a very real thing about this place right like we are we are so willing to engage the other whether that other be Somebody who, you know, uh, like somebody on the street who, you know, we look at as, as somebody who is who is displaced or whether that somebody is somebody who we disagree with because of their intolerance and say, the only way that I'm going to help you out of that intolerance is by engaging you directly. Right. That is, um, you know, something that I've learned. Mm-hmm. Right. Um exposure really kills off bias. Mm-hmm. It kills off fear. Yeah. You know, because um, it's like I say this sometimes in organizing right um it's old and gold i don't need your acceptance i don't need your passive acceptance it does nothing for me it, it just it doesn't mm-hmm. what i need is your understanding yeah you know i need you to be able to understand me because what you understand you don't fear mm-hmm. and whatever it is about carbondale it seems like the environment is just conducive to developing an understanding mm-hmm. and like as a transgender woman as a bisexual woman um you know as a polyamorous woman it's like, you know, people are really open minded here mm-hmm. in, in uh, you know, a lot of different ways that people in all sorts of other places just wouldn't be. Yeah. Right. And so I'm able to feel welcome and at home in a place like this, which is nutty to me, <laughs> you know, um, just great. I I I'm overjoyed with the fact that I live here. But, yeah. you know, I've I've lived in worse places. Um, it's like. It's just really cool to meet with and talk to someone who has lived here their whole life and who is a product of those yeah. really beautiful values. Well, and, and again, it's not, you know, there there are there are different kinds of people who have lived here their whole lives, right? right. There are the type of people whose parents moved here and they were born here and lived their whole lives here. But like I'm a different kind of from here, right? Like when I say generation, I mean we're talking pre nineteen hundreds. <laughs> right? We're we're talking like you know, family that's that's been around, like Aunt Mackie, who was 90-some-odd years old when she passed away, and, like, the family that were some of the folks that started some of the earlier trailer parks on Pleasant Hill and right. um, uh, Warren Road, and great-grandma worked at the glove factory and, uh, you know, all this type of stuff. Like, I, I really only go back to, uh, you know, the, the history of my family that I know uh, is of the folks that were alive when I was alive, which is kind of crazy to me, right? That like I never had any exploration beyond uh, the folks that were alive when I was alive, which is kind of a bummer, right? I've thought about doing the ancestry thing, but I'm like really cautious about my data in that particular <laughs> set, so I'm kind of iffy on that. I'm free but, like, dealing with mine, yo. It's all out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's really cool though. Like you know, I've I've had interactions with people who, you know, I I you know, I didn't understand their relationship like specifically with my grandfather right right and people uh, uh, you okay homie yeah yeah i'm good um uh, people people sharing with me uh, you know the 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 traits that they experienced right. engaging with him and being like that was a good man. Right. And being able to like, tell me like what, you know, that what I saw was very real, right? What I got to experience, 
uh, you know, and, and, and some of the people that I do try and define myself uh, through that, that are, um, you know, my, my, my lineage, right. That, that, that the people that I'm, that I try and draw from are the right people that I should be trying to draw from. Um, and, and to, to be, to be living in a community where, where people can give you that kind of insight to validate um, the position that, that you're trying to take without you even like expecting for that to be a thing is a big deal, right? That that just happens. Um, whew, okay. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I talk uh, about this phenomenon a lot because it's like, I came here as me, right? And not only did I fall in love with a Carbondale, Right. And it's a Carbondale that I understand and know in my own way. Yeah. But there's a Carbondale that cracked open just enough space. Right. For the me I knew to be me to fit into it. Yeah. You know, and like if it's able to house people like me Mm -hmm. and people like you. Yeah. I mean, you know, and and people like all of the wonderful, diverse, you know, perspectives and lives and, you know, um, and not just diversity as a word, but diversity as a life lived. Uh, diversity right. as an as an active process, yeah. right? It's like it it can't help but be that because it, I mean it it makes so much space for it. Yeah, you know, I mean it just it's a magnet for people who want to be themselves, yeah. right? Whatever that means to them, yeah. and uh, rewards good qualities. So the other side of that that I think is very interesting, right? The the plaque downtown adjacent from uh Thai taste uh is a plaque that that describes daniel brush the founder of the town standing on top of the original brush building where Thai taste is now waving the american flag essentially saying come and get it to the confederacy <laughs> saying screw you guys i'm an abolitionist this town is an abolitionist town, right? And and saying like, "Ha, huh, you know, like this is my stance, and you're gonna have to pry, uh, you know, this position out of my out of my cold dead heart." Right. And the the other side of that is not just that this place makes space for that, but that people work and put in a lot of effort to generate that space right that that space takes the like we have that we have the space that we have because people have put in the work previously and people will continue to put in the work and now that balances out right with understanding that imperfect uh you know uh, stories that have led to this point you know you have you have what is essentially a protagonist and antagonist stances right Right. that without without there being legitimate struggle in this space there would not be legitimate development of the space that is better for people that have experienced the struggle this is a place and i've come to learn this it's rooted in struggle like the cultural legacy that we that we get from here that we've always had is like that of struggle literally in the inception of the town Mm -hmm. right but then like you know, through all of the different human rights movements that have erupted and the moments of, of extreme tension, yeah. right, that have really, you know, found a, a space and a home for clash, mm-hmm. you know, and argument, and um, at times seeming war right here mm-hmm. in this place. Um, I mean, it's the truest to God um torch that could be passed down in my opinion is that of like you know ongoing struggle Mm -hmm. you know um and and struggle toward what i you know i i dare not say but struggle you know no i mean just for the sake of struggle wherever it may be right develops character in the individuals that experience it right that's it that's all it comes down to like you know, people say, ah, you know, diamonds are, you know, are just coal under pressure or whatever that may be. But that, I mean, that's kind of the, the general analogy that folks make. It's like people, people are, you know, should they, should anybody have to experience these struggles to begin with? No. Right. 
but we live in an imperfect world where there is always that struggle and there is always some fight to be had. And so for folks to, to have experienced it here and then not just themselves be better because of it, but saying, I'm going to make the world around me better because right. of it, like that's, that is like a core Carbondale thing. And there are so many people that are representative of that. That's again, I mean, we've got more, this. we've got more community groups here per capita than just yeah. about anywhere else. Yeah. Anywhere else. And yeah. I'm, I'm like anywhere else, anywhere. Yeah. And they're, and they're actively intertwined. Yeah. Right. That's the other cool part about it is like, it's not just a, like a cannibalizing of, uh, of activity and, and resources. It is an intertwining of activity and resources and allowing people to kind of like take on their own particular components that right. need to be taken on at any given point in time, whether that's now, 20 years from now, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. Whatever it may be. If you've got a banner and a struggle to take up, there is a place for you to organize around <laughs> it here, too. Like, we, we won't just make space for you. We'll make space for your banner, your cause, and whatever yeah. you want to say. So, so uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cycle around because I'm guessing <laughs> what's the... What's we are the... at 125 an hour. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah it's, it's, I gotta... Sorry, you're going to have to cut down a lot. No, no. I'm, no, I'm going to just... No, this is perfect. I'm going to send it out there. I'm not worried about it. Um, <laughs> so so the, big, the big idea for me is... Right. The, this place doesn't exist without having people in it. Like we, we need we need a stable population that's somewhere around twenty five to thirty thousand people. Right. Right. Like it, we're not going to get there overnight, but we got to start working to get there now. Right. You know, um, two years ago, uh, I started positioning the idea that what we need to be doing is marketing Carbondale, yeah. which has an abundant stock of housing an accessible cost of living. Right. And a uh, generally uh, accessible community to become a part of in a short amount of time. We need to start marketing ourselves to people who are being displaced by climate change. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, very, very easy to do it with American citizens. I'm not saying like, you know, we got to we got to search the world for people displaced by climate change. Like I would like for us to have some international communities see Carbondale as a place where they can find solace right. and safety and a home, right? But it's just as easy to look at the United States and say, there are wildfires in California. There are floods on the East Coast. There are hurricanes destroying the Gulf. Like, we are well-positioned, right, for the effects of climate change to not be as ravenous to us as it will be in other parts of this country, right. let alone other parts of this world. We're a donut city, you yeah. know, like we're a donut region where we our climate's going to improve, mm -hmm. you know, due to the effects of climate change. We have species migrating to us away mm -hmm. from other places. You know, we're getting increasingly biodiverse mm -hmm. on a on a natural level. And, here and we were already biodiverse change. to begin with. Like, I Southern know, Illinois, it's like, crazy. you know, it's a it, I, I don't I never use the right language because I don't have all the right scientific language. I always use temporal zone, but I know that temporal zone is not the right phrase. But like we're a merger of like six geographical zones all in yeah. one, like prairies and swamplands and and bluffs and, and mountainous regions. And like it's it's just it's wild. It's very real. It's we've also got world class professionals here, yeah. like climate scientists, yep. Justin Schof. And like we've got a sustainability commission at the city of Carbondale that actively tries to prioritize, you know, like advocating for to the city council yeah. not to say that it gets heard to the degree that it should in yeah. my opinion yeah. but like you know we've got people here who are deeply passionate about environmentalism mm -hmm. yep. you know i mean earth day happened here in what 1970 yeah. you know yeah um i mean like and and you had buckminster fuller here who yeah. talked about creating livingry and yep. you know ardent proponents of you know, tackling the climate crisis head on in the middle of the 20th century. It's baked into what this place is. I know, right? man. And like we, so like on the one hand, I worry about uh, coastal elitists mm -hmm. seeing this place as like, you know, a, a place to come gentrify or something. Yeah. And that's like, that feels like a way overblown. Fear, no, but right? it's not. Way overblown. It's not. No, 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 no. <laughs> here's, here's, here's the deal, Claire. I, so that is something that's very much a concern for me as well, right? And right. I think that's that, you know, if we're gonna go back to like the idea of WTF Carbondale as like a digital front door for this place, right? Like we're appealing to the right kind of people. Agreed. Right? We're not trying to go out there and, and just find people that have a bunch of money and insurance dollars and whatever else and saying, move here and come plug your dollars into the economy. Like we're looking for the people want that it, want know. to do the work to build community. Right. That could be 
you you could be poor, you could be rich, you could be white, you could be black, you could right. be straight, you could be gay, you could be whatever. But the point is, right, we're positioning ourselves to find the right people for this community, not just any people for right. this community. Yeah, I and, mean, I think that's a, a perfect sum up, you know, like we need more people. Yeah. And we are worth it. Yes. You know, we through just the course of this podcast, but you in your own, you know, decades of work on mm -hmm. it, you have identified key characteristics that make this a worthwhile place. So it's funny that you say decades of work because I can legitimately say that at this point. I found uh, I found a, a thing and I posted this on social media a couple years ago. But like I've, I, I have a I have like a letter. Carbonell used to have like a uh, like a like a like a kid's uh, Carbondale conservation corps or something, something where you could like volunteer with the city and like do some help stuff. And I, I don't have any like memory, like recollection of this just because I <laughs> guess you block out memories over the course of time and whatever. But um, so, so like I don't have any memory of what I did for this program, but like looking at the day, it's like, okay, I was 13 years old. Or I was like 11 years old, something like that, and it's like a letter of thank you from the city, and it's I I think it's like signed by Mayor Dillard, and like it's like it's a tangible thing that says like Nathan was participating in community building when he was but a child. Nice, uh, you know, and whether that was something of my own doing or something that was you know uh, you know the the forced interest in social status by my family is neither here nor there. The fact is, it's like. I did it. Like it's right. there. Like it's very real. It's very tangible. Yeah. Like even if I can't recall it, it happened. Right. <laughs> right. And it clearly has fed into what I've become today and like where I'm looking to go in the future in like being part of this community. Um, and, and uh, so, so on, on the whole thing with appealing to folks who are climate refugees, right? Like that was an idea two years ago that again still working on these digital front doors because that's how people get introduced to our community right and holy cow i mean the the number of requests now that i've actually set up instead of just like letting anybody join the group like i started with anybody can join and then it went to okay well i'm going to put a gate on this and i'll look at people's profiles you know when they come in if they look like they're in carbondale and they says lives in carbondale they'll be accepted if they don't you know you're out of here but now i'm at the point where like i ask a question do you live in carbondale yes or no can you prove it and so I will have folks that join the group and say, I don't, I'm not there yet, but I'm moving there. Right. Right. And I, I'd say we get about three people a week, give or take. Right. Right. Which is a pretty decent number for just a little Facebook group to be like, we're moving there. And, um, you know, then I'll, then I'll kind of watch, well, do these people immediately interact or they just kind of come to check it out? And often I'll see people that come in and, you know, I'm, I'm moving there. I've got some questions. I'm, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what rent's going on and blah, 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 blah. And then people just jump in and start like sharing and, you know, loving and caring for these people before they even get here. Right. There was a gentleman who moved here from, I believe, Alabama. Um, he and his husband moved here and his husband passed away within months of them moving here. And he, you know, he, he hasn't, he hasn't been super active in the group lately, but he was, he, he had been uh, more active in the group, uh, you know, when he first got here and then uh, after his, his husband passed away and he was like, listen, I, you know, just being part of this and communicating with you all in a digital space and still being able to go out and interact with some of you in physical spaces, even though it's, it's COVID time, like it has made, working through this really difficult loss more bearable and like thank you Carbondale for being here for me and like that's a very real thing that is replicable across this entire community it's not just for that one person that one experience it is for all um, I mean when you talk about climate refugees yeah right when you talk about like that being a future thing. It's like, yeah. I know what it's like to come here as someone who's fleeing religious persecution, Yeah. right? I already consider myself a refugee yeah. having w moved to Illinois and Carbondale mm -hmm. to seek a better life, right? I know it can be done. It's out there. Yeah. Like it is a future that is very attainable for us. You know, I think your head is in the right place yeah. looking forward um, as far as what we can achieve here when we've got shrinking coastlines. And, and this is this is where I, I think after I, I say this one last bit, I think we're good to wrap up the podcast. All right. Just because we're at <laughs> an hour and a half now. Uh, excuse me. Um, excuse me. But um, so that was the I that was the hypothesis two years ago. Right. The hypothesis has been proven oh, yeah. now because of COVID. Yeah. Nomadic, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna call them COVID nomads. 
right? Like deurbanization's pe- real. Yeah. So so people people have have left and fled wherever they have been. Uh, you know, uh, most commonly in in urbanized areas, right? To to seek out uh, places with more physical space for them to be. You know, near others, but further from others. Right. Right. So, you know, the hypothesis was attached to climate refugees. We know they're they're going to be displaced. That that's very very attainable so long as we simply ask them to come here. Right. Um. But but the proof, uh, in the concept, has come through watching uh people, you know, purposely move themselves because of COVID, and so we've now had the case study. We've seen it happen all over the country. We were behind the ball on it, but that doesn't mean we can't get ahead of the curve. Yeah, so agreed. we need to do that. And if I've got like a core component to why I'm running and have sought political office, there's a lot of things that I want to work on, right? But these things can't be solved if we don't have the people here to solve them, right? right? And we've got a lot of people here that are willing to solve them and willing to educate others on how to solve them but we need those others that can be educated to come to this community so we can all work together to make it just continue to be carbondale right that's it that's what i got that's wonderful nathan (laughs) i think that that's a great place to land here you know so Um, you got your switch back to the other camera all right and how do i close it out Hi, thank you for joining us. This is Claire Kilman, your guest host. This was a podcast with Nathan Colombo, one of the interesting people we talked about interesting things with today. Thank you for joining us for episode 37 of the WTF Carbondale podcast. And then all you got to do is press the stop button.